Deep listening. Uh, deep listening. Well, we're going down to some of the deepest physical spaces for music today, and we're going deep inside our own listening to find strange soundscapes and weird reverberations. We'll find musical works created as soundscapes, as environments for our listening, and we'll think about a handful of pieces from the 19th to the 21st centuries that are designed as sonic environments as much as they're made as musical works. And thanks to the composer, Jez Riley French, uh, who's with us today, we're going to listen to environments from the depths of the earth to the resonances of empty concert halls so that our ears attend to the profound sonic experiences that we can have when we open ourselves up to deep listening. And to deep listening with a capital D and a capital L because we'll hear the band, the practice and the way of relating to the world that the composer and improviser and sonic explorer Pauline Oliveros created in the late 1980s in Washington State in a disused military cistern and which became a philosophy that spread all over the world, something we glimpsed uh, in the last talk in this series with the composer Rolf Hind. But before all that, just a wee note on the word soundscape, uh, which was coined as part of the musicological and compositional lexicon in the 1970s by R. Murray Schaefer, who you can see in all his glory here, telling us to listen, quite right too. Uh, the Canadian composer and thinker, and Schaefer's broad approach is to treat sonic environments, whether man-made or natural, urban or rural, as a network of sounds and energy that deserve scrutiny in the same way that musical works have been paid close attention and analysis. And Schaefer's goals are as ecological as they are musical. They prove the point that to listen deeply to these soundscapes that shape us and which we shape is to realize the environmental power of music and the musical power of the environment. And he puts it like this, the soundscape of the world is a huge musical composition unfolding around us ceaselessly. We are simultaneously its audience, its performers, and its composers. That's, I think, a beautiful summation of our combined responsibilities to our soundscapes. Now, Schaefer regards music in the way that we usually define it, at least as one small part of the soundscape of the world. And he's right, of course, as Jez Riley French will prove to us later. But in the first half an hour or so of this talk, I want to turn Schaefer's ideas around and ask what happens when we treat musical works themselves as soundscapes, as total environments, instead of as self-contained objects. Our soundscapes, you see, aren't only those of the whole world, although they can be. For the time they last, pieces of music, too, are immersive sonic environments. Now, to do this, uh, we'll need to think of musical works through all of the parameters of their creation, the contexts of listening created by their acoustics and the architectures where they're performed. We'll need to understand the symbiosis between composition and listening culture that these pieces create, and all four of the situations that I'll briefly outline for you so that we can glimpse what this approach might offer, uh, soundscapes by Wagner, by Gustav Mahler, by Pauline Oliveros and John Luther Adams, uh, require the existence of a way of listening in which we give primacy to the musical experience as the focus of our attention in concert halls or on recordings, as opposed to thinking of an opera house or an auditorium as a place of social transaction, something we've demonstrated in an earlier talk in this series. Well, Schaefer himself quotes Wagner in one of his discussions in the book you can see there, Our Sonic Environment and the Soundscape, The Tuning of the World. To the eye, Wagner says, appeals the outer person, the inner to the ear. And so let's start here, uh, in a place that looks like uh, the most unlikely candidate for a, a progenitor of an ideology of deep listening. This is the fabulously ornate Margraviel Opera House in, in Bayreuth, one of the jewels of Rococo theatre design, completed in 1750 to the specifications of the Markavina Wilhelmina. But fascinating as Wilhelmina is, and the cultural splendor she brought to this North Franconian town by Hoyt in the mid-18th century. Well, the kind of listening that happened here uh, around that time would have been the kind of gilded, showy noisiness of the contemporary Paris opera, as we experienced and, in fact, recreated here in the Museum of London uh, in an earlier uh, one of these talks. Instead, it's rather what happened in this theatre in the later 19th century that inaugurated a new kind of musical work, a new theatre, and a new music drama. Because Richard Wagner originally thought that this theatre, with its disproportionately large stage, could have been the vessel of his musical dramatic dreams. He considered it as a potential place for the premiere of the complete cycle of Der Ring des Nibelungen. Now, 
from what we know later happened, this seems almost unbelievable. I mean, the mythos of the ring is another world from the gorgeous ostentatiousness of this theater. And Wagner realized it wasn't right too. It was too small, too rococo, too bright, especially after Ludwig II had installed the theater's first electrical lighting rig. But Wagner did conduct Beethoven's Ninth Symphony here in, 19, in 1872 to commemorate the laying of the foundation stone of his new theater on a green hill, just a short walk up from the train station, if you've ever been to Bayreuth. And that was what he built as the true realization of his compositional dreams. And this is the plan of Wagner's Festspielhaus in Bayreuth, as it was designed and built in the early 1870s. And the plan represents a fusion of ancient Greek theatre design with modern technology. It's by Otto Bruckwald, based on an unrealized design by Gottfried Semper for an opera house in Munich. And there are a few things that this stage plan, or rather this architectural plan, makes obvious. Because it realizes Wagner's dreams for the democratic distribution of the audience, so that no one is more privileged here in Bayreuth than, than anyone else in terms of what they can see on stage. There are no aisles, there are no boxes in the body of the theater. But yet, while there's a democracy in terms of the way the theater is made, in terms of sight lines, no seat is better than any other, essentially, in Bayreuth, uh, there is a hierarchy here in, in a different sense. Because sitting on the exquisitely uncomfortable chairs in the theater there. There are no arms on either side of the seats. There, there's no velvet of any color or stripe, no cushion at all to accommodate or cosset the bustles and finery of what audiences still wear ludicrously at the Bayreuth Festival every year. There is instead a complete focus on the stage, on art. Oh, Wagner's democratic theater then is really a place of total subjugation to the artwork, really of course, to his artwork, in which our individuality is effaced by the absolute concentration we're now forced to give to what's happening on stage and to the world-changing and world-ending dramas that play out up there. Compare that to the Margravial Theatre or to the vast majority of 18th and 19th century theatres. Remember the earlier Paris opera that, uh, a few talks ago? Or think about the, the gilded extravagance of the golden assal of the Musikverein in Vienna, a golden temple to visual as well as musical splendor made for music in 1870. Or there's the wild extravagance of the Opera Garnier in Paris, which was being built at the same time that Wagner was building the, the Festspielhaus in, in Bayreuth. Bayreuth's interior, uh, is positively austere by comparison. It's not only the discomfort of those seats, it's the lack of ornamentation. And the fact that there's nothing to distract our eyes or our ears from the dramatic mythologies of Wagner's music dramas happening up there on the Bühne, the stage. Now, something else you'll notice in this image, or rather you won't notice because you can't see them, is that the musicians are invisible. For the first time in an opera house, the whole orchestra and even the conductor are unseen. And they're hidden because Wagner wanted the illusion of his theater to be as complete as possible. So the messy choreography of the conductor, the bows and breaths and reeds and brassy tubes of those hundreds of musicians down there are the means through which the musical illusion is made but they're conjuring, like they used to say about children, well, anyway, I'm not going to do the children gap, but the conjuring should, should not be seen. What was, what's the thing? You know, children should be seen and not... Well, anyway, the point is that... They, thank you very much, seen or heard. So they should, they should be heard, but not seen. You, anyway, I, that, that was an unfortunate ad -lib. The point is you can't see the musicians. That's, where, that's the point I'm trying vainly to make. Um, the, the, and the, the, the mythic idea of what that means as a theatrical experience uh, is is borne out in what you experience in the theatre, because at the start of the ring cycle, the opening of Das Rheingold, which is this low E-flat major chord, the birth of the Rhine, the birth of the universe, the birth of myth, the birth of gods, mankind, and everything in between, well, what happens is this sound emerges from underneath you, from underneath uh, those seats. It seems to come from some other place and then swells up to inundate you in the theatre. It's a perfect realisation of what Wagner wanted this theatre to do. But the Orchester Grab, which is what it's called in German, the Orchestra Pit, literal translation can also be Orchestra Grave. Uh, the musicians, though, are down there. Uh, and uh, here's an image of the meeting of those two worlds. And as you can see, the musicians are in, the t in their T-shirts. They don't need to wear uh, concert gear. And the audience are, are in the tuxedos. 
Um, and this is an image from Stefan Herheim's production of Parsifal, uh, Wagner's last opera, in 2011, in which the grave, in fact, is twofold, because that mound you can see on stage there, sort of crossing the threshold of the proscenium, is a, a recreation, a very precise recreation of Wagner's grave at his villa in Wanfried, which is just a short walk from, uh, from the Festspielhaus in Bayreuth. Uh, just, I'll come back to Parsifal and we'll listen to it too, but... There's something else that Bayreuth as a theatre incarnates in the service of this new focus and concentration on the new religion of Wagner's music dramas, which is darkness, complete darkness in the theatre. Now, it's something we take completely for granted now in our cinemas, theatres, opera houses, even concert halls nowadays. Uh, but it was Wagner who did it first, or kind of. Uh, the Wagner that the audience experienced at the first production, uh, the opening of Bayreuth in 1876 of The Ring, was in fact a mistake. The gas lighting system uh, had only just been fitted, so it wasn't quite ready to be used, so Wagner just turned the lights off. Uh, and inadvertently discovered another essential feature of the Bayreuth experience, and actually you know, transformed the whole of theatrical history, really. The near total darkness in the auditorium, just that faint glow from where the musicians probably reside, uh, and then the sound starts. Uh, there, were, there were also grave limits to uh, the success of that illusion in the 1876 production. One of the, one of the great things, an era before dry ice. So the only way you could create the absolutely essential smoke and vapour effects on stage was to use huge locomotive engines for steam. <laughs> So what, you can imagine what happened. You know, you've got this going at the beginning of, uh, of Das Rheingold, all those essential things, the rainbow bridge, you know, just these local, literal locomotive engines in the bowels of the theatre pumping up this steam into the, into the auditorium. So, of course, what happened? It started to rain. And, in fact, it started to rain on the instruments. So, you know, if you're play, you could, you, you know, some of the, and the other thing there is the violins, the, 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 the first violins are, in fact, on, on the right-hand side, the second, anyway, they were getting rained on and obviously going a little bit out of tune. Um, but anyway, it's, it's not the ring cycle I want to play. It's the opening of Parsifal, uh, this Bühnenweih Festspiel, as Wagner called it, a stage festival consecration play. It's a great German translation. Uh, that was premiered by Wright in 1882, the year before Wagner's death. And, and look again at this production from, uh, from 1911. Uh, this, is, this is, in fact, the, the, the first production. It's the same as the first production that was seen in 1882, on stage at least. And as you can see, the, the way that the, the staging actually, the set design merges into the architecture of the theatre, quite deliberate this, of course, because it turns the entire theatre and everyone in it, in the Temple of the Grail, which is the climax of the first and third acts of Parsifal, we become celebrants at this temple of art. And this proves the point of what Wagner wanted Parsifal to be, which was an embodiment of art as religion. In 1880, he'd written an essay, Religion and Art, which he said that art needed to rescue the spirit of religion from conventional ideas of what the religious meant. Parsifal is proof positive of what he meant. Um, and the, it was this production, in, in fact, the, the, and the idea of pilgrimage, the idea of temple, uh, Wagner and Cosima, his wife, insisted that by, uh, the Parsifal only be played at Bayreuth, couldn't be performed anywhere else. That was their idea, ever, for all time. Uh, but in fact, there was an illegitimate production for the first time at the Met in New York in 1903, and of course the piece is now performed uh, elsewhere around the world. But it, it sets the point about what Parsifal was supposed to be as uh, pseudo spiritual, artistic, religious experience. But more than that, in terms of the sounds it makes, Parsifal is the only piece that Wagner actually wrote for Bayreuth. Of course, The Ring was premiered there, but Parsifal is the only one he wrote when he knew what the theatre sounded like, felt like, and how it worked as an experience for all of us. So it's a, really a, a site-specific soundscape for, for Bayreuth, the whole of Parsifal. And in the sounds that this piece makes, the orchestra, right from the start, is conceived as a a series of sound masses rather than an assemblage of different instruments. Wagner makes his orchestra melt and merge into weightless, dreamlike vapours and exquisitely blended atmospherics. He's making music for these particular acoustics because, um, as you can see there, the, the lip above the orchestra, in fact, it's better in the next one, you can see, the sound in the theatre there, because of the way the lip of the orchestra is constructed, bounces, is directed to the back of the theatre first, and then kind of comes back to, comes to us in the audience later. It, it's very difficult to conduct there because you have to deal with this, this sort of uh, this dislocation between the time you're conducting and the time the audience are hearing. Um, but it means the sound that we experience in the theatre is pre-mixed in this in intoxicating blended sound. So we're going to listen to the opening paragraph of the overture of Parsifal. 
And uh, here it is, uh, here's what it looks like on, on, this is just the first page of the score, but there's a few things I can tell you about it. It starts with this unison melody, um, the, no harmony, no accompaniment apart from that tune. But the way he scores it there, it, it's uncanny, this melody, uh, because he creates a halo of timbre and colour around, around the sound. It's shared among the strings, bassoons, and then clarinets and coronglay. And it's, when it's etched down there in the orchestra pit, it also melts harmonic stability and our sense of pulse. It liquefies musical space and time, in other words. The notes float above and beyond the bar line, and what starts as an A-flat major arpeggio subsides into C minor to come back to A-flat. But you can see when, the, when, it, when it gets busier in bar six there, when the, the other woodwind instruments and the violas get going, uh, you've got a, a complete dissolution of time there. You've, you've basically got a, a kind of set against one another divisions of nine and 16, so nine notes in the same time as 16. It sounds exquisitely precise, almost mechanistic, but the effect is absolutely precisely calibrated by Wagner to, to dissolve into atmosphere so that we have this weightless sense of orchestral sound. So this music, uh, in my view, and really the whole opera, uh, because, and then it's then through this prelude that the, the whole, it's, it's a veil through which the whole drama of Parsifal then happens. And I think this piece is a, a, really a, a consecration of a deep listening practice that transforms an aesthetic idea into an environmental, immersive, and transformative soundscape. So here is the first three minutes or so of the Prelude of Parsifal played at the theatre in Bayreuth. It's a very slow tempo, uh, but it's uh, worth hearing. This is Wagner's working sketch, which you can follow along if you like. There's a few seconds of just the theatre warming up, and then it begins. So Parsifal is stage, festival, consecration play. Well, more like a site-specific environment for deep listening, the depths of where the sound comes from and the depth of the experience in which it invites us all to participate. 
Now, Wagner's innovations were a direct influence on perhaps the greatest operatic conductor of all time, who was also a composer, Gustav Mahler. And Mahler's symphonies, uh, taking further the innovations of everyone from Schubert to Tchaikovsky and uh, above all, uh, Wagner, extend the idea of the musical work as soundscape, as an environment for new kinds of listening. His symphonies turn concert halls into simulacra of forests and Alps, the first symphony, the third, the sites of apocalyptic and atheistic resurrection, the second, stages for dramas of love and death, uh, the fifth and the sixth. But in terms of using the symphony as an environment in the concert hall for a heightened and a deepened listening soundscape, I want to show you the last page of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, composed in 1909-10. Now, I, a lot to tell you about here about the 80 minutes of the symphony that happened before, but enough, as you can see, that uh, the 100 or so musicians, 100 and more musicians, 120 usually, who are used in Mahler's Ninth Symphony are here at the very end of the piece, uh, just hollowed out uh, to this uh, gossamer tendrils of just a few uh, string lines etched seemingly over uh, a silence or a, a great stillness. Uh, the score itself looks voided and empty, and you can see Mahler's, uh, Mahler's advice to the, to the performers how they should, how they should play at the very, the very final bar, that word ersterben, dying away. Uh, the piece is a, is a bridge from this life uh, to the next, from musical existence to non-existence, not just pianissimo, but, pi but four Ps, pianississimo. Now, the, the thing about this, in performance, this piece is a, a realisation of Schaeffer's idea of this threefold responsibility that we all have for our soundscapes as composers, uh, uh, as performers, and as audience members, and that we are doing that all the time. For the performers, they have to be so careful here. Any misguided bow stroke, any tiny any intake of breath, let alone a wrong note, I mean, that's going to scar uh, scar what Mahler's doing here. But it's the same, the same is true for us in the audience, a rogue cough, a mobile phone, I mean, the, 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 we're, we are, the, this, the, the existence of this page of music suggests that by the time Mahler is writing it, he never heard it in his lifetime, it was premiered in 1912, but he's, he's, he's writing it only for a listening culture in which an absolute concentration is possible for us. You know, the, the, the piece is written absolutely in dialogue with that expectation or that demand from us as listeners. Um, I want to play you a performance of it. Uh, it comes from the Lucerne Festival in 2010 with Claudio Abado. Um, and you, you will see and experience how the audience then, and I'm sure you here too, that the, at the end of this piece, there is, uh, the piece gives itself over to uh, an incredibly loud, it's not silence, there's no such thing as silence as we know from previous talks in the series. Nonetheless, there is a deep stillness that's created at the end of this performance. Um, so I invite you to participate in this as uh, listening participants in the soundscape of the end of Mahler's Night Symphony. Um, here we go.
Um, yeah, I, I, it's quite emotional, that. Um, I, I, I know, apologies, but it's only, I know it's the last couple of minutes only of that symphony, but um, th 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 that, that stillness there, it was something that's given and created by the audience. It was, it was of course, it was site-specific in the sense that it was the, 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 the lighting had gone down in the concert hall, but nonetheless, that was not a, a silence that was, or a, a potential quietness on behalf of us listeners that was forced. It, it, was, it, was, it felt like the destination of what the the whole symphony was, and to have a, a symphony whose destination is two or three minutes of deep listening is a, an astonishing feat of performance and an astonishing feat of composition too. But the concept of deep listening has a precise history, because it has, it's a practice and sound world that's indebted to the American composer and improviser Pauline Oliveros, she's at the left of the camper van there, um, who died in 2016 at the age of uh, 84. Now, it's not just that deep listening is her idea, it's also her album and her band, uh, and it comes from a, a very specific moment in 1988 where deep listening as a practice and as a pretty terrible pun it gets cemented in Pauline's life and music making thanks to a disused military facility deep under the ground of an otherwise remarkable bit of country in America's Washington state. Uh, in the autumn of that year, 1988, the trombonist Stuart Dempster asked Pauline and the vocalist Panayotis to stop off on their way to a concert to experience the most, one of the most amazing man-made acoustics ever created, a, a cistern, an underground military bunker at Fort Warden in Port Townsend, 70 miles northwest of Seattle, in which, 40, 14 feet underground, there is a reverberation time of 45 seconds. And when you consider that the reverberation time in St. Paul's Cathedral, not so very far from when we're speaking now, is 11 seconds, that gives you an idea of the, the gigantic, cavernous sense of space uh, that this, this, this cistern had. Um, but as James Bull of Gresham College was telling me, in fact, the world record for the largest reverberation time in a man-made space is an inch in down in Scotland. Uh, it's a Royal Navy oil uh, depot, which you have access to through tunnels in the hill. And down there, you'll find a reverberation time of 112 seconds. But that was only discovered in 2014. And magic, isn't it? Pauline should have been there, of course, but anyway. Um, so playing in this acoustic in, in, with such a long reverberation time, again, creating these site-specific soundscapes from, uh, from, from that place, uh, is, uh, presents special problems for the musicians, because if you, everything you, every sound you make in the air is going to last that long, uh, you have, they, had, they reported an uncanny sensation that they didn't know what was reflected sound and what were the new sounds that they were making. So effectively, all of them were performing with the shadows of the sounds they made playing with echoes so that the performance we'll hear a fragment of is a, a feedback loop with their own musical pasts. It's as if the music is listening to itself. So a site-specific environment for, uh, for listening. Let's hear uh, a track that was recorded in 1988 in this, uh, this completely improvised uh, session that happened in Fort Warden, uh, the inauguration of the Deep Listening Band, music from Lear.
Pauline Alvarez's Deep Listening Band. Now, that's a recording of that very site-specific um, uh, lo location. Uh, th there will be time for questions, at the, I'm hoping, at the, at the, <laughs> before the hour is up. Um, I'm, I've, um, because I've talked at greater length than anticipated about Pauline and Gustav and Richard, uh, I want to uh, bring Jez Riley French to, to, the, uh, to the platform very shortly. Uh, in, in order to, to discover more about John Luther Adams's Become Ocean, I urge you to uh, read the transcript of this talk, which is, <laughs> which is online at Gresham's website. Uh, in, in summary, the, the point about this piece is, is a, a composer who's made uh, decades of work in environments, uh, working with music with an absolutely ecological and environmental uh, purpose, uh, here repurposing the orchestra as a place for uh, 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 an overwhelming soundscape, as, uh, as site-specific, as careful in its calibration as the, over, as the prelude from Wagner's Parsifal, but with the but with the idea to give us in the audience in a concert hall, again, transforming a concert hall environment into a place of musical ecology. It's a piece I would urge you to listen, and it's the single longest evocation, or, or rather embodiment of the uh, of kind of oceanic consciousness in the orchestral repertoire, 45 minute long orchestral piece composed in 2013. Um, that's, one of, that's, the heart, that's one of the heart parts from it. And this is what I was going to play you. But, um, uh, but even better, it's now time to welcome to the stage uh, Jez Riley, French composer. And we're going to think with him, having th thought about soundscapes in opera houses and concert halls and the idea of particular acoustics and environments giving rise to deep listening. Uh, Jez, we're going to think about music uh, and ecology and indeed the, the ecology of music and the, the relationship between the two. Please welcome Jez Riley, French. Yes, thank you. Just before we start, before you tell us about this, does, uh, is there, what's the relationship for you? We'll, we'll hear one specific piece later in which you're recording, working with the, the sounds of empty concert halls, rather like what we heard at the end of Mahler's Night Symphony, but you're uh, making a different kind of piece from them. Mm. Is, there, is there a connection between you and Wagner in that way, in terms of... <laughs> in, 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 in terms of well, did you buy any of this, the idea of soundscapes being Not possible? at all. Not, Not at all? Very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, good, okay. <laughs> Um, well, that said, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so, Thanks for the invite. No, it's a pleasure. But the, but the, the connection between the, the creation of these uh, sites for listening that yes. is, is going to take us take us out of ourselves that can be created in consoles, and of course it can be created uh, when you're listening to environments. Yeah, in, for in me, it started as a, I was a choir boy uh, when I was uh, I think I was ten when I first started, and we had a really sadistic. Um, Choir master, he used to make us sit and listen to the church for like 10 minutes before each rehearsal inside. Listen to the church? Yeah. yeah. So at the time it was really annoying, but I think, it, <laughs> I think it really gave me this sort of love for the sound of architecture, you know, just, just listening to, to buildings quietly. That, that was for me, the, and, the, and the link to the music was, came from that kind of experience of listening in silence and then singing in the space, you know, that was my... So it was, how, did you, how did you then uh, transform that experience into, into what you do with microphones and into taking that listening, not only in buildings, or, but, but also to the, the natural environment as well? Uh, I'm a series of accidents. Most of my life has been a series of accidents. Uh, I, got, I got given a, a cassette recorder for my 12th birthday uh, to record John Peel off the radio, basically. <laughs> Bootlegging BBC. Um, but, you know, we all did it. But I, I just started sort of recording sounds around the garden and stuff like that. It was a purely, you know, intuitive kind of, how can I use this little recorder sort of thing. And it went from there. I just got more and more into, into listening as, rather than collecting sounds. That was the, that was the, the change, really. Uh, the, the, this, this first line, there's, there's a reason you've chosen this. Uh, yeah, well, I just really love this line here. Um, At the top of this line. Yeah, the posture of being all ears, giving in to a listening for what's inaudible. Because much of my work uses um, specialist microphones or devices to listen to sounds that we can't normally hear with our ears, naked ears, or that in some way need, need that extra device to, to access. Uh, so I just thought that was really nice, a really nice quote from a, a Japanese-French uh, poet. Uh, and so what, what then are the kind of techniques that you're using to listen deeply to environments which are otherwise inaccessible or maybe on the edges of our hearing and indeed our, our auditory perception? So I use contact microphones a lot, which pick up sound through vibration. So directly on Directly on, on surfaces and materials, yeah. Uh, hydrophones for listening in water, geophones to listen to the infrasound of the well turning or, or really low frequency sound. Ultrasonic detectors for the high frequency sounds above our range of hearing. What was that? <laughs> the door. <laughs> that was carefully planned, that. It took was, us, absolutely. It took us weeks to organise exactly. that. 
and, the, and this, you see, the, one of the things, uh, the, one of the connections that, that John Luther Adams wants us to, wants us to make, and Pauline Oliveros mm. too, with the, with the ideology, with the the ideas of deep listening is to attune us into environmental listening so that we, and as, as Aaron Murray Schaefer said as well, and as in their different ways Mahler and Wagner wanted us to do too, to be more sensitive to those yes, yeah, acoustic yeah. environments, those sonic environments, to take responsibility for them. Mm. Uh, w- one of the things that's often... Um, Discovered or thought is that we, we still have even in, in even in field recording uh, an idea of uh, the, the the sounds of what, of, of that image there yes. uh, are bucolic you know the, the, um, somehow uh, that we as a human species are going to hear lovely sounds of winds and birds and isn't that delightful uh, so you know we're still actually putting ourselves on that landscape but this 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 slide tells a particular yeah story it's, about it's, that. I mean it's all about perception isn't it that's the thing and, and this was a quite a pivotal piece for me in the sort of early eighties this is just a bad. Uh, image from a photocopy handout but there was a series of commissions in a forest in North Yorkshire um, and I was the third I think in the series and when I got there I read the comments from the piece that had been before which I think was a string a string piece, piece for strings and the comments were almost all negative all saying how dare you do this to our beautiful forest and so I, I, I'd created a piece for guitar feedback but I, I changed what I was going to do so I installed a new piece left came back at the end of three weeks read the comments all negative, how dare you. I hadn't been playing anything through the speakers at all. There was no sound. You hadn't been... The nothing. speakers were there? Yeah, it was completely was something. <laughs> <laughs> so basically people were listening harder and they thought I was amplifying the sound of birdsong or the trees or the wind, but I was doing nothing. It was just they saw a speaker and assumed something was coming out of it. So that... <laughs> It's kind of. Well, what does that tell you about our relationship with our sonic? Well, we invent it, you know, and and we, we're constantly like like you said the, the sort of country idol idea of nature. When in fact nature, if if you go and listen to a meadow in the summer, and you sit there thinking this is beautiful, for every other species it's a slaughterhouse and a battle yard. You know, it's it's not peaceful for every other species. It's just our perception. Mm. And I mean, it's, you can still sit there and enjoy it and think it's beautiful. But I just think knowing that, knowing that it's we're creating that. I think matters, you know, I think it's important. It's, all, it's then about taking responsibility. Now, well, that proves the point of, of how listening itself changes the environment, changes our relationship sure. with the environment, possibly even changes the environment itself. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, so some examples then of, 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 what we, uh, of what you've been able to, uh, well, to allow us to hear that wouldn't have been heard otherwise. Yeah, th- these are telepherikas, which I'm kind of obsessed with. Um, they're in northern Italy. The, the long zip wires, basically, for bringing building materials down from the, the forest into, into the villages. And if you walk up to on the side, you know, you can't hear them. Um, but if you put these contact mics on, you get to hear this amazing kind of soundscape. This is the wind blowing the wires and also little insects or branches hitting the, hitting the cables. Yeah, I mean, I think the, one of the things that's really important for me to say is I'm not a sound collector, um, so I'm not interested in just finding odd sounds. For me, it's about the experience of listening. So with that, with all of my work, it's durational. So I, I'll sit and listen to those for eight, nine hours. And, you know, that's, that's how I get into all of the variety of what's there. Because if I was just interested in, oh, there's a weird sound, I'll collect it to make a library from it, I'd record two or three minutes. And then I wouldn't hear the sort of way that the wind alters the sort of ebb and flow of the sounds and the, the temperature changes and the cables tighten. It changes all the time. So, so are, are you co- composing what we've heard then? Or is that, is that a... Is that a is that no, that's a, just, that's just a straight time. recording. Most of my work... I mean, I used to compose with field recordings when I first started, but for the last 10, 15 years, most of my work is just straight a straight recording. Do, do you feel in that kind of situation that you are nonetheless... Is the environment and is the telegraph, uh, is that iron wire and all the sounds you're hearing kind of composing your perception or is it the other way around? You know, is, is, it, is it, how much is it, the, the attention you're giving to it? How much well, I think the attention doing? is the composition. I mean, I think with, with field recording, when you're out with a recorder, the first act of composition is pressing record, you know, and the last act is pressing stop. 
And then you've got to listen to eight hours of, <laughs> <laughs> of recording. So, v- Wagnerian duration is just another connection. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, uh, well, and the, the, the next example here, Salt's Adagio, is this is this is a project which is made from the reverberations of uh, or yeah, this, I, this, this, the, the interiors of concert halls uh, stimulate. I mean, I'm really passionate about listening, as, you know, as a as a person rather than a company. You know, I, I love listening, and I I kind of like listening in very weird places. So <laughs> I like well, I like if I can get permission, I like climbing underneath the stages when orchestras are playing or going up into the ceiling. Because I just love the fact that, there's, you know, as, as a composer, you get to play in, or have your pieces played in amazing buildings, but you very rarely actually play with the building. And I love that. So I, I've done these series of works which I've rescored um, adagios for, like, durational performances, and I've mic'd up the entire building uh, and recorded them with contact mics and geophones to pick up the reverberation of the architecture so the, the building is sounded by the musicians. But I mean, I mean on, uh, that, that, that is the point about what all the... I mean, that, uh, I, I know I'm making laborious connections, which you don't necessarily <laughs> agree with, but it seems to me that... The, no. that, the, 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 well, precisely that Mahler example is written for a mm. very particular concert hall environment in which there are certain expectations around environmental quiet in which that can yeah. happen and in which that performance is going to be received. Well, I mean, so, a lot of music was, like the but, church composers, you know... Precisely. Talis and... Uh, were at four specific churches. All those the churches in Venice as well. They're, they're yeah, very, yeah, they have very different tones and part. different overtones. Yeah. But the difference here is that you're attaching the, the, so what we're going to hear then is, is the sounds of the building itself being agitated stimulated yes. into vibration rather than you know sticking a stereo pair of microphones exactly, in the exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's, it's a bit I suppose it's a, like to use a visual analogy it's a bit like using a very soft focus lens on the orchestra Range frequencies that are technically would be regarded as wrong. Wrong. You know, I mean, like if acoustic engineers would say, "Oh God, you know, you've got all that mushy mid mid range frequency that's not supposed to be there." But I, I love it. Anything that's wrong, and I'm straight there. <laughs> but it is, you know, these are. Well, I was going to say they're echoes, but in a way that they're not. I mean, these are real sounds which are always there as part of our experience in concert halls mm. or lecture theatres like this, but which we're not usually what not usually attuned to. I, I keep thinking when I'm hearing all this, just that you're you're listening not only deeply, but it, it's you know, it's inside. It's yes. inside materials. It's inside a wire. It's inside the fabric of a building. It's in, in inside in some cases, and perhaps we'll hear later the uh, the earth itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't really know where that came from in my twisted mind. <laughs> But I do like getting under the surface of things. You know, I don't know. I don't know where it came from. Is, is there? A, is there? A, is, has Pauline Oliveros been input? I mean, the, the no. Um, I mean, I discovered Oliveros much later. Mm. And I, I, we were just talking outside actually about mm. the internet. And I mean, I stumbled across Pauline Oliveros by buying a, a CD in a sale, like that was like a pound because the shop couldn't sell it. But uh, the, back in those <laughs> old days, you couldn't go online and find out who Pauline Oliveros was or. And especially in Hull, you couldn't go and buy a book about <laughs> Pauline Oliveros. So it was really hard to discover all that. The first musician I actually discovered was Anaya Lockwood, Lockwood who was actually in London next mm-hmm. week. She's, she's right up there. I mean, if you don't know her, go and see her work. Cafe Otto. Um, I discovered that through, through folk music, because a, a label that did a lot of Scottish folk music also reissued the Glass World of. Uh, I discovered her work, and then I managed to find something in the library that was, um, I think, a Tiger Balm music or whatever, which is a, a, deep, a kind of deep listening piece from before, before mm-hmm. Oliveros, I think. Uh, so that was my, my connection. But Oliveros I found out much later. 
we're, the, the, there's more directly um, environment. It sounds like the yeah. natural environment now. Uh, and again, it's, it's one of the things we uh, uh, skirted around in this series is the, the listening. You, you've already described it. The idea that when we attend to something, when we listen mm. to something, we assign special qualities to it. Whether you want to call it music, whatever, it doesn't matter what that label is particularly. The mm. act of attention itself being really the definitive thing. Yeah. And that, that's obviously what's happening here in, in creatively opening up these sound worlds in the natural world that we're just not aware of without your, without you. Yeah, and there are, well, I mean, there's other people doing well, it. But without your... <laughs> not <all> people. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a prime example. And, and the other thing is, you know, we can talk about it and we can contextualise it. This is just great. It's just, <laughs> this is the sound of a rock dissolving. A rock dissolving. Just a, just a rock dissolving. I mean, I'm from Yorkshire, so having an installation with a tiny piece of rock that costs nothing, that you picked up outside, <laughs> and then took a citric acid, you know, it's like cheap. So, so, the, this is, so the process is rock dissolving in acid. This so is the rock dissolving. So it's a small theatre in which this is happening. Exactly. But there's a massive range of sounds there. And so it should... The, the distribution of rock. That's just a bit of a bit of air trapped in the rock coming out, you know. <laughs> and if you listen over the course of five or six hours to a little pebble <laughs> dissolving, you'll hear little rhythms building up and then falling away as, as the as the gases or the, the air so, has been released. So, are, is, what, what is your perception doing here? In other words, are you musicalizing what's happening precisely with that by by identifying patterns that are there? But the rock itself isn't trying to give you rhythmic patterns, right? You're, no, you're, exactly. You're projecting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when I'm sat there listening, you know, I, I can try and analyse it and say, you know, why am I listening past the first hour? Um, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm either a genius or I'm insane. But <laughs> no, but it, I am just hooked by this stuff. And funny enough, somebody asked me about this and, and about VLF, which has a very similar sound but much higher frequency. The, the, VLF is um, the radio fallout of sounds in space. And somebody commented that all of this stuff sounds like the crackling of an old vinyl LP. And I think that might be one of the reasons why I'm initially attracted to these sounds, because it's kind of that, you know, we all had that in our teenage years, listening to the crackling of a brand new LP, just bought and getting really annoyed and trying to work out a way to be happy about it. <laughs> What, what, hap what happens to you during the recording process? I'm not sure. Is the next one, uh, are we in Iceland next? Yes. Because, uh, it's, it, again, I Iceland's another place uh, where it's, uh, actually, particularly right now, it's become a very fashionable tourist destination. All yeah. sorts of debates there about the impact of, if you like, listeners in the environment or tourists in that environment, people who go to see and to hear in a way, yeah. uh, and who then are having a deep impact on that environment coming back. But also, it's a place where there's a particular association around, again, a kind of sublime about what these sounds might be, glaciers and their wonder. And, and all that sort of thing. Do, mm. What's your relationship with, with an environment like this when you're in it that long? Do you are you seeking to become part of it, or are you? Uh, I in, think in, again, in a, I'm, I'll force another uh, connection here. But in that Wagnerian sense of you know us being celebrants at the uh, at the ritual by becoming part of something bigger than ourselves. Absolutely, what Wagner's intention, mm. Mara's is, Pauline Oliveris is too. Is it yours as well here? Is it your experience in these environments? Well, I think for, for me, I do become a part of that space and that time. Um, I don't seek to, as in, I, I, don't, know if, I don't know if I can verbalise it, but um, I don't go out looking for recordings. I just carry my gear with me at all times. And sometimes I'll feel the urge to press record or to listen. Um, this, this is slightly different because, it, you know, if you travel to Iceland, obviously you kind of, you know you're going <laughs> to go there and record, you know. Um, and this, this particular, this is actually a really sad story, actually, in terms of that impact. This is Fjell Salon, which is behind Jokul Salon, which is a really famous glacial lake in, in uh, the south of Iceland. You know, huge tourist area, loads of coaches turning up. This was the secret one behind. And this was the last glacial lake in Iceland to not have a motorboat service on it for tourists. You could pay 20 euros and get driven around and then chip some ice off and put it in a vodka. That's what they do there. Mm -hmm. And this was the last one. And the week we were there, they were building the sheds to put a motorboat service on, on this one. But, you know, we, we went there, it was a seven-hour drive from where we were staying to get to this. We went there thinking we'd record for, like, two or three hours. It, it, was, it was a workshop, I do a lot of workshops. And a lot, quite a lot of the recorders were like, two or three hours, Jesus Christ. Because <laughs> quite a lot of them were sound designers, and so they wanted 30 seconds, and they were off. 
But we stayed there for eight or nine hours. You know, and we had to. We literally had to round people up because they were just so immersed in the in the amazing experience of being. It's a hell of a privilege to sit there and listen to a glacier dissolving. So, so, you, so here it's a glacier. You know, this is a this is a glacier dissolving. This is recorded with hydrophones directly into the mm-hmm. into the water. So special microphones for underwater. Oh, hang on. Let's try that again. No, nope, that's the. <laughs> This is underwater sound. This is underwater. This is basically ten thousand year old air that's been trapped in the glacier, slowly coming out of the of the the lumps of ice as it as they drift past. The hydrophones were literally just just where this photograph is. It's quite bird like as well in mm. parts. That sort of mm. high pitched tweet. It's a, it's a completely different sound to whatever those images of glacier dissolution might have suggested before mm. you hear it. Mm. Amazing place, and it's it just like, like I say, a hell of a privilege to go there and record, you know, and listen. And also the place, of course, where the myths of Wagner. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the, um, the, you've got a, a, a final example, which is one of these things which when when you say it, just seems uh, impossible that we're going to be able to hear this. But this is the, the sound of the rotation of of the earth and the idea of deep listening, the idea of... You can't get much deeper than that. No. So, so how, how do you record? And again, uh, and the, the, the impact on you as a listener, uh, mm. of course, acoustically, but also... Well, that's, that's really listening. interesting because you can't hear this when you're on the field recording it because the frequency is too low. So it's infrasound. It's it? infrasound. Um, I, I use geophones, which are usually made for measuring seismic activity on a, like a visual readout. I've adapted them for audio. So in, in your headphones and through your recorder's preamp, the, the headphone amplifier, you can, you can kind of hear something's happening, but it's, it's, there's nothing there. You just have to watch your meters and see that something's happening. And then when you get, get back, you can kind of process it so that you can hear about 20, 20 hertz and upwards. We can only hear down to about 20 hertz. I can actually hear down to 17 hertz in one ear. Um, and <laughs> why? But, um, but most of this is inaudible. If we had massive subspeakers here, you'd feel it as a force. And, and how did you do this? I mean, how deep are you in the earth here? Is this just a, a crack on the surface, or how, how, does it, where, how did you physically record this? Oh, well, this is a very lovely image of it, but actually the geophone was just stuck in a bit of mud outside this cave. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless. So here's the sound. thing about infrasound is it's here now you know, it's all around us and it actually controls our bodies so our, our internal organs are regulated by the by the vibration our eyeballs everything is regulated by the vibration it's, it's having you can feel this very directly mm. what I mean. it also just genuinely does remind me and honestly it reminds me of, of the beginning of that E flat the beginning of Das Rheingold and by right this is what Wagner wanted you want a better creation myth than this you want the beginning of Das Rheingold and now the rotation of the earth that is deep listening um, Jez thank you very very much thank you. just, just a, a very uh, final thing we can keep the infrasound if you like so, uh, one of uh, Pauline Oliveris' uh, deep listening meditations uh, making this connection between our responsibility uh, our, our Mary Schaefer has put it in everything we've heard today uh, as you listen the particles of sound, which Pauline Oliver has called phonons, decide to be heard. Listening affects what is sounding. The relationship is symbiotic. As you listen, the environment is enlivened. This is the listening effect. Um, mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have five minutes up here to listen to your questions. Uh, there will be a, a, there is a microphone which I would ask to wait uh, to, for it to come to you. And there is a, yes, a question uh, there. Thank you. Yeah. At the beginning of the evening, you talked a lot about Bayreuth, mm-hmm. uh, which reminded me of the Philharmonia. When the, Walter Reg, Leg founded the Philharmonia Chorus, the best thing he did was bring Wilhelm Pitts from Bayreuth 
And every rehearsal was like a private singing lesson. It was Amazing. absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Another question. Thanks. Yeah, I noticed with the... Um, Pauline Oliveros, there didn't seem to be much of a melody, uh, and again, mm -hmm. also with your with your soundscapes, and I just thought it was very interesting to note that, in a way, sort of Wagner was with his music was telling stories, and then as it becomes more modern, we're not so much telling stories, but sort of just reflecting what's happening in nature, that sort of thing. I just thought mm -hmm. the contrast was extremely fascinating. Uh, well, thank you. I, I suppose what, what I was trying to do, and I, and I admit it was an attempt, uh, is, to, is to suggest that within uh, the phenomena of the things that Wagner created and Mahler created and others, there are melodies there, but actually as a way of listening, he's asking us to attend to similar things that I feel personally, that the, the kinds of ways that the jazz and Pauline Oliveros and many others want us to listen, that, that it's, it's not only about the the storytelling, absolutely, of course you're right, that's, a, that's an essential part of the experience, but the, the experience of a, a, a transcendence through a site-specific soundscape experience is common to all of them. But, but, but you're, you're right in that sense, although I think um, certainly when it, come, when it comes, if you listen to longer stretches of, of the Deep Listening Band album and all of their performances, you'll hear the very slow musical lines. I mean, we heard it in the, even in the short excerpt that I played at the, at the end, Pauline's just a semitone in the accordion <laughs> out of this drone, which is built on uh, the, uh, the harmonic series. So you feel a kind of... I feel immersed in a, in a world which is potentially melodic, if you like. It's just that the melodies are happening much slower. Yeah, but no, but certainly, that's, that, thank you, that's a very accurate perception. Uh, thank you. In the last recording, which I enjoyed very much, um, mm. can I ask, um, how did you know that was the, uh, the sound of the rotation <laughs> of the earth? Thank you. <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very good that's question. A good question. <laughs> Not just the sound of mud. Um, you know, like. Well, I mean... The, the, I know the science of it, as in that the, the well tone does create infrasound. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, you can kind of research that. And I knew it was there. And, and using geophones, that is, that is all you pick up. You only pick up the frequencies below our range of hearing. And it takes massive movement to create that. So, for example, if, if I'm recording with geophones next to a, a motorway, I can hear, obviously, the, the vibration of the traffic. But if then, if then I stay recording through the night when the, the traffic stops, you can still hear this low hum. Which is, which is just the sound of the world turning, the, the constant sound which is always there. So it's part research and part experience. And, and again, the, the, the simplicity of method here, Jess, you are, the geophone, you are attaching a, contact, a microphone to a surface, which is yeah, on there, right? Yeah, it's a spike, right? actually, that goes spike, in. Okay, okay. And I mean, I mean, but it, but it, it doesn't demand a huge technological rig to do this. It's done... Oh, it, it takes well, years of... Yeah, well, of course, naturally. <laughs> but. <laughs> but, I mean, the thing with geophones is that there's a golden rule with geophones that... Yeah, the proof thing is it's partly to do with research and the science, but the other thing is if, if you are recording with geophones and you do hear something very loud, run. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, we have actually reached seven o'clock. I wonder if there's time for one more question. Just, there we are, sir. Thank you, thank you. If, thank you. I, I, some of the sounds that people have going around them but don't necessarily pay attention to are in cities, mm. yeah, just about. Do you think that if you're playing the sound from different cities, you could know which city oh. you were in? Yeah, but, Absolutely. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes, one hundred percent. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, there are some sounds that we like. If you if you played the sound of a you went out into the centre of London and recorded two or three minutes with sirens and people. Yeah. You, you, you might different think, sirens in New York or Tokyo. Or <laughs> yeah, the sirens would be the giveaway. But I, I, I personally think you can. But it is about again, it's about attention. It's about you know you play somebody thirty seconds of several different major cities and they might think, well, I can't really tell. If you played them five or six minutes, then they would start to hear some differences. You know, I'm, I'm convinced of it. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember being in New York a few years ago and talking to a DJ there who was working with. Uh, as many of the sounds of the city as he could, he could use in his work. And, uh, and he said that it had been shown that the, the dominant frequency of New York, which is after all, you know, it's on, it's over marsh, you've got, uh, you've, uh, you know, it's built on mud, so you've got, you've got a lot of vibrating things there. <laughs> uh, and it, which, it was a very, very low B flat, apparently, right. <laughs> New York. Uh, and the composer, a friend of mine, is, is, is sure that the earth uh, rotates in A major. But I, I'm, Jez, I'm sure, will have something else to say about that. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very, very much for being here, and huge thanks to Jeff for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.